Player preferences are a really handy way to store data uh, both within the same play session and uh, from different play sessions when the player may have turned off your app, left for a while, and come back. A good way to think about it is long-term variable storage. <laughs> it's not, probably not exactly right, but that really does nail the point of what you're doing. Let me create an empty game object and add an FSM so we can step through and talk a little bit about some of these player preferences. So actually, I'm going to scroll down here because it's got its whole section, player preferences. And it looks like a whole bunch of stuff in here. But when you really look, it's not that much. It's actually a limited set of stuff that gets exactly to what you need. Uh, you've got setting a string, setting an int, setting a float. Or you can get a string, get an int, or get a float. So there we've already used six of them to basically just set and get information. Uh, we can also check whether a, uh, a, a certain player preference has a key. Uh, we can delete that key, and we can delete everything. So let's take a quick look at some of these. Let's say we want to store some information in player preferences. That's really where you have to start, because after all, you can't get anything out unless you store something, right? Let's go ahead and choose a player pref set int and talk about this a little bit. Uh, it asks for a key and a value. Now, the key is really kind of like the name of a variable, right? You have to name your variable, and then you can store information in it. The key is the name of what you're storing here in player preferences. And you can pull it out of a variable if you'd like, if you've already got one. Uh, but you can also just name it. And this is a string. So you could say something like high score. You could call it high score. And then probably you would be tracking the high score uh, in some way. I could say, I'm just going to use uh, the touch count, for instance. Uh, maybe you've got uh, a variable and it's actually high score or something. And, you could then put it in here, and when you used this, when you ran this, it would store a pre uh, an entry in player preferences called high score, and it would put in this value. And get that out. Let's. You could also hard code it like that, 13 or something. If you wanted to then later retrieve that, you would use the get int. The get int. What you would do there is enter the same key. In this case, high score. And once again, that sometimes it's good to have a variable so you don't get typos, right? But in this case, I'm just typing it in. So high score, uh, and then it asks for a variable where you would like to store it. So you might have to create, like, uh, say if I'm, if I'm working with an int, right? I can say current high score. Back here, uh, I can tell it to assign the high score to that. So I can retrieve information out of here put it in here. So now I've got an variable and I can go around and do whatever I want with it in the game. Like use it to determine whether you should uh, unlock stuff for the player or figure out what level they were on or whatever it is you want to do. Both of these have a count and what that allows you to do is check for instance two or more. Uh, I've got it for two. I could put you know high score and uh, <laughs> man, lowest score if you were tracking that. Or uh, you know current level Whatever it is that you've stored, you can do multiple ones. If you want, you can check 10 of these at once. Because really, you might, at the beginning of a level or when the app first fires up, you might check a whole bunch of stuff and load it out of the player preferences and then uh, use it throughout the game. And then when you're done, you might come in and, uh, and save it all, put, you know, stash it all away, that it's there for later. That works equally well, like I said, with floats and strings as well. Get rid of these out of the way, so we talk about them. They look the same. Float and string, you're, you have to set a key, and you need a value. Same in both. <laughs> I deleted the float, sorry. But you know what I mean. They're all the same. Let's go ahead and pull that float out, since I said it was going to. They all look the same. Every entry in the player preferences has a key, okay, and that's its name. And then every entry in player preferences is going to have a value. And each one of these will let you do multiple ones at once. That is really what you're going to use most of the time, is get and set. And it's just like getting and setting variables somewhere. Kind of, If you think in those terms, you're going to feel really comfortable with it right away. The last few things here. We can check uh, player preferences has key. And this is really a way to kind of do a conditional. Like, remember when we've done bool tests and 
you know, int compares and things like that. This is right along that same line. You can check for a particular key, for instance, our high score. And maybe we've never entered a high score. Like maybe the player has never played this game before. And if they haven't, we want to display a tutorial. And if they have, we're not going to display it because they've got a high score and we're going to move on. It needs us to have um, somewhere to put this. Let's say if we go uh, current high score in integer, that looks pretty good. Oh, and guess what? It's not an integer here. Uh, high score, it's looking for something else. But oh, oh, I'm sorry. Store result is a Boolean, actually. <laughs> My mistake. It's storing a Boolean like can hit. Like when we did the uh, screen pick or a raycast, it says did hit. So really it's looking for a Boolean, which is true or false. And let's go ahead and set one up really quick. Bool, and we will say um, um, has I score. Put that in. So then we can add it here, and that's going to be a 0 or a 1. So that gives us something we can test against later with a, with a, uh, a bool test. And if you don't want to do that, you can just right here use a true and false event. It'll tell you whether or not it has it and give you true and false events so you can run out. So for instance, if there is a high score, you just go ahead and load up regular gameplay through an exit event. Or if it doesn't, then you could instead route to... Uh, a series of events that would show that tutorial that we talked about. So that is how you kind of test against a has key. And our last ones were delete key and delete all. And these, I think this should be pretty self-explanatory. If for some reason you ever wanted to delete high score, you just put the key in there, run this, there's no other option but put in the name, and pow, it's gone. So be very careful with this, because once it's gone, it is really gone. You may want to delete it, you may not. Uh, player preferences delete all. This is even more dangerous <laughs> because there are no options. Uh, what you get with delete all is everything gets deleted. Your entire player preferences are going to get wiped out. Just flush them. So you'll use this a lot while you do development probably because you'll screw around during your testing and then you'll need to flush everything out uh, or delete a particular key or you know that sort of thing. So you can clean it up and test it from scratch. You might end up doing that a lot, but you may not have a lot of call to do this during games. It depends on what your game's about and how you want the players to persist their data. That is all of the little uh, actions in a nutshell. I've set up a really cheesy little game called Fantasy Attack Game. And uh, oh man, it is the best game in this entire video. <laughs> Let's go ahead and take a look at it. I wanted to give you a real example, even though this is a cheesy game. I wanted to show you where you would use player preferences because I think that's, that's half of the confusion is where do, I, where do I use them, right? I've got a preferences manager and it's got three FSMs on it, a game, uh, the player preferences itself, and a timer. And first let's look at the timer and just get it out of the way. It's really easy. I, uh, I start up the game, uh, we, when, whenever a start game is called, we flow into this. We pick a random number between 2 and 5, which is a float. We store it in time to wait. And then I do uh, a wait based upon that time we just got randomly. And when that's done, I come here to end game, and I call the end game event on another FSM, which is uh, this one here, the game one. And when that's done, I flow into ready again. So basically, whenever this gets pinged, it cooks off for 2 to 5 seconds ends the game and comes back around. That's all it does, okay? I put the timer function on its own. And in the FSM prefs, what we have is a start event that just, uh, it, it sets this text to blank, the current high score, just wipes it out so there's no display. Uh, it waits for a call from another FSM, which is gonna come from this FSM game, to update the score. And when it does, it it calls a player preferences get int and it looks for the key pp player name okay so that's the key i've got it stored in a variable it's a string and it's going to store the result in this last high score integer variable and then it flows out into the compare scores and the int compare simply looks uh, at the pp current hits and the last high score so this is what's going on in the game right now uh, which will 
we'll see what's happening in the game. And then the high score that I pulled out of player preferences. And it checks if one of them is higher. So if they're equal, nothing happens. We just go back and wait for the next game. If it's higher, if the, if the new one right here that you just got in the game is higher than the one that we got out of player preferences, that means we have a new high score. <laughs> Pretty easy, right? So I flow down into new high score. I then do a player preferences set integer. And I set this key. Remember, it's the same one I use, PP player name. Same one I used up here to check. Okay. This time, now that I know it's higher, I uh, put in the current hits value. So I replace the old score with the new high score. I just do that right away. And then, oh, my bad. Then we uh, convert it into a string really quick, uh, build it together to say uh, the player that's picked has a new high score of, and then we insert the string. Pretty cool. If you haven't used this build string, check it out. It's a really neat way to put a lot of different data together. And then I update the uh, GUI text object here so that the player knows what's going on. It tells, shows the new high score. Then we just do a wait with a button. And this option allows you to clear scores. So here's text, uh, clear scores, and and remember this when this is done, it just floats here and puts up a GUI button. Nothing else going on. And if you call uh, reset to ready uh, from the game, then it goes back to ready and nothing happens. But if you press the button, it calls clear scores. And I uh, wipe that text out that says high score, so it doesn't display anything. And then I do the player preferences set int. And I set, there's two players in the game I'm about to show you. So I set the key value of the two player names, Gronk and Thag. And I said it was fantasy attack, right? So <laughs> there's some fantasy names uh, with the appropriate amount of seriousness that this example deserves. So Gronk and Thag, and uh, then you set the value to zero. And what that means is remember, clear high score or clear scores i'm clearing it by setting them to zero i'm not deleting them i'm setting them to zero you can do kind of a soft clear without deleting uh, i didn't necessarily need to delete these completely so that is that and let's take a look at the game the game well actually let's go ahead and look at the game first because it'll make a lot more sense if i uh show you it being played so fantasy attack game so i play pops up and says choose character and I have a button that says thag <laughs> a button that says gronk and let's say I choose thag zero monsters killed so I get to click attack and as many times as I click it you can see it updating there we go uh, thag has a new high score of 13 and thag <laughs> took an arrow to the knee after killing 13 monsters the game is over all right so I now can play again or I can clear the scores so if I choose to play again I come back to this first screen so this time I pick gronk and I pick, I don't know, let's say I only get five monsters killed. So I have a new high score of five. Because remember, there was no score at all. Those were set to zero because we haven't played this before. And let me play again. And there, you remember I talked about the check to see if it's higher? Well, if I go to Gronk and then I manage to get above five, so now I'm at eight, uh, it's definitely a high score because eight's higher than five. That's the one I had last time. But if I play Gronk again and I only get, say, three monsters killed, there's no high score. It just says Gronk's dead. Too bad. I don't get the option to clear because I don't have a high score. Uh, so <laughs> that's part of the game logic I've built in. You have to get a high score in order to clear it. Maybe that's not a good idea. Um, and then I can play again. So that's all there is to fantasy attack game. <laughs> Pretty impressive. But let's take a look at the logic here. The character selection here has two exits, uh, two exit events. Character Thag and Character Gronk. And that comes from these two buttons, which you saw displayed. And they just say Thag and Gronk, and they call those two events. Pretty easy. Not a big deal. Here, uh, I set an integer, this PP current hits, which is what I was using to track the high score. I set that to zero, so it's reset every uh, beginning of the game. And then these two set texts just um, say choose your character, and the other one wipes out um, the text results. So. We're just clearing house and, uh, you know, keeping track of things and updating the character or uh, the player appropriately. So then we get the option to choose Thag or Gronk. And all these states do is set the current player name to either Thag or Gronk. Pretty easy. 
and they flow out into the start game. The start game sends an event to the timer, and we talked about the timer a couple minutes ago, and it sets the GUI text that says, Attack! <laughs> this lets the player know that the game is on. The finished state flows, uh, flows out into the play state, and here uh, we convert an integer to string, which is the current hits. We build a string to say uh, however many monsters have been killed, x number of monsters hit, and we output it to the player. And that happens every time you uh, start the game. And you've got a button, and this says uh, attack. So that remember, we'd click on that button in the middle, and that's what counted up the attacks. Every time you click the button, it sends the hit uh, exit event. And that comes up here to add kill, which just adds one to the uh, current hits integer. And then flows right back here into play, which once again converts the integer to a string, outputs to the player that they've got one hit, and we get to press the button again. This loops for that random amount of time. When the timer is done, it calls end game. Remember, it calls an end game event. And I have end game. Uh, as a global event right here. Remember, you've got to check it as global if another F F FSM is going to get to it. From either of these, because I don't know which, which one it's going to be in when the game ends, so I put the same event in both of them, and they flow into the results area. And what this does is send an event to the FSM preferences, which, remember, the preferences handles the player prefs uh, and tells it to update the score. And so that is um, right here, update score. So that starts this whole thing running. And that's where it goes in and checks the integer to see if we've got a high score and all that. So come back right here. So that fires off that event. Then we uh, do some more updating of the player, uh, building strings, updating GUI text, all that. And once again, a GUI button that says play again. And when that's pressed, it flows us out into the reset to ready. And that sends a uh, uh, event out to uh, FSM preferences because if you remember again, that was hanging out right here waiting because we can either clear the score or reset to ready. So that tells the uh, preference checker to be done with what it's doing and get ready to play again. And then we flow out to the choose character. So that's it, a really simple game. I'm not going to show this on an iPad because, frankly, there's nothing uh, iPad specific about it other than how it saves, and the save works on the on a computer as well. This is the whole example, but this does run on iOS. I'd encourage you to try it. The buttons will work. Uh, Unity naturally allows these buttons to work as touch as well. This is a, a complete little cheesy game, and I, I just wanted to show you how you could set it up and kind of where you would do it. And you probably want a preferences manager that handles this kind of stuff on its own. And, and honestly, you probably want to take things like these buttons out of the game logic. Like here I've got uh, buttons and results and all that. Probably better off to have buttons you know, being shown elsewhere if your game has any level of complexity. It works with a really simple thing like this. And one last thing to say about player preferences. They can... Uh, be a little bit of a hit on a mobile device to performance, just like uh, creating an object. I would recommend that you do it as infrequently as possible. In other words, check it when the game's loading and the player isn't doing something actively. Check it when you, uh, like the player's done, uh, you know, he's not playing, he or she is not playing the game. Check it in those times, like when you're loading a uh, results menu when you're loading a menu that allows them to select uh, what game they're going to play, do it as, as little as possible. Get the data, load it into memory, work with it that way where it's nice and fast and, and easy to work with, and only save and pull it out when you really, really need to. Uh, and that's where you balance. You don't want to do it so infrequently that the player loses a high score, right? You've got to do it often enough, but don't do it in the middle of gameplay. Just do not do it in the middle of gameplay. It's a bad idea. Uh, and that is player preferences.